The Virtue of Sound Doctrine When Jesus said in John 7, 16, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me, he was speaking of the doctrine of God, the whole truth concerning the gospel. There are many doctrines in the world, because the meaning of the word doctrine is a belief that is taught, or a principle, a position, or a body of principles in a branch and knowledge or system of belief. That body of principles to which Jesus subscribed was the law of God for all mankind. It embodies the whole plan and purpose of God dealing with man. Although Jesus was capable of setting forth his own doctrine, he refused to do it because he was committed to preach, teach, and practice the doctrine which had already been established by the Heavenly Father. It is only true doctrine so far as God's dealing with mankind is concerned. It needs no revisions or alternations of any kind because it is the product of an infinite God. It was recognized as such by the psalmist David when he wrote in the 19th Psalms in verse 7 that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, and the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Anything that is truly perfect cannot be improved upon. It works perfectly when it is applied in practice for its intended purpose. Now this is the doctrine which Jesus embraced and taught. And not only that, but he was a living example of it. The true doctrine of God to man is always referred to in the singular and never in the plural. There is only one true one. It would be incorrect to refer to it as the doctrines of God, because there is only one body of belief or system of belief and practice, which God will accept for the redemption and eternal preservation of those who believe in him. Now, when reference is made in the plural, the true doctrine is not intended. In Matthew 15 and 9, Jesus makes reference to the doctrines of men. The Apostle Paul in Colossians 2.22 writes about the commandments and doctrines of men. In 1 Timothy 4 and 1, he also writes of the doctrines of devils. And the writer of Hebrews in chapter 13, verse 9, writes about being carried about with strange doctrines. Now, these references alone should be enough to convince the skeptic that there is a very clear distinction between the one true doctrine and the various and multiple doctrines created by men who are influenced by Satan. Now, it is possible to be led astray by a false doctrine because it sounds so reasonable and appealing. But one must remember that the true doctrine is not necessarily compatible with the natural reasoning. It is stated in the Word of God and it is to be accepted whether it is understood or not. This is not meant to suggest that one is to take everything he hears in the name of religion and embrace it for belief and practice. Definitely not. But that which comes from the Word of God takes precedence over any doctrine of men. Because the doctrine of God is the final authority in the relations between God and men. One learns the true doctrine as he obeys and does what he knows to do through what understanding he already has. God does not continue to reveal his truth to those who reject it or stop short of obeying what they know they should. Jesus explains this principle in John 7:17 7, in these words, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Jesus sets forth the requirement that those who would know of the true doctrine must do the will of God, and the will of God is nothing short of obeying all his commandments. The will of God is often cut short by those who lack the courage to uphold all his commandments. They will advocate strongly the appealing and the aspects of God's will, but they begin to de-emphasize or eliminate completely those aspects of doctrine which make the person see himself as he really is before God. But it is only when one sees that he needs to correct that which is not right before God that he takes steps to improve it and get in fellowship with him. The doctrine is the total will of God for man, not just the parts of it which are easy to live by, nor only those parts of it in which God commits himself to give out to man, but it also includes God's commandments which man by sacrifice and submission prepares his soul and body to keep. The Apostle Paul, in writing to his son in the Lord, Timothy, tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Now, if all of this is profitable for doctrine, then the doctrine or the true doctrine must include all of it in its meaning rightly divided. 
If one takes only part of it, he cannot say that he takes the doctrine, because a fragment or a fractional part of it is not it. The doctrine is the whole body or system of it. Anything short of that is not the doctrine. Paul had a great deal to say to Timothy concerning this subject. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, he instructed Timothy to charge some who were departing from the faith to teach no other doctrine. There is always the possibility of straying from the doctrine of God into ideas and opinions of men if one doesn't constantly consult the scripture to see if he is in the faith. Human reasoning and logic may be more appealing to the person's mind than the truth, but they will not save a person from destruction. A part of the doctrine of God is to recognize and respect the constituted authority under which one serves. In 1 Timothy 6 and 1, Paul again writes, Let as many servants are as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemy. In this master-servant relationship, Paul sets forth a principle of the theocratic government which is consistent in all such relationships. It is ordained of God that some must have delegated responsibilities under which others serve to do the work of the gospel. Even though Paul was speaking specifically of the secular master-servant relationship here, the principle also applies to the work of the gospel under theocracy. In writing to Titus, the Apostle Paul admonishes, But speak thou things which become sound doctrine. In Titus 2 and 1. Sound doctrine is the forthright, straightforward, uncompromised word of God, presented in love and compassion with patience, as he who presents it considers himself also, lest he be tempted to use divine authority to abuse those who do not measure up to it. Now, Paul continues in this passage to show the effect of preaching and practicing sound doctrine. When he said that the aged men, he says, must be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and patience, that the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to too much wine, verses 2 and 3. And this is not to be taken as license to drink a little or even moderately, or to drink any other intoxicating drinks. But such drinking is clearly condemned in the scripture. But Paul continues that they should be teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, taste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemy. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Then he turns to Titus himself with these words, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Verses 7 and 8. That, that dear one, is a commentary of the effect of practicing, listen to this, sound doctrine. It is a guide for daily living and brings about the right relationship between individuals and with God. Now, in another passage, the apostle tells us that a characteristic of the last days would be that some would not accept nor embrace sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy 4 and 3, he makes this comment, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. One needs only to know that what is going on in the pursuit of religion today to know the truth of that statement is true. In many, many quarters of so-called Christianity and well, you know, known non-Christian religions, the doctrine of God is suffering at the hands of evil and lustful minds who want to make their religion conform to their lifestyle rather than conforming their lives to the will of God. But it is here where Paul again, who instructed Timothy in a manner that would be good not only for himself, but for all who were under the influence of his ministry. In 1 Timothy 4 and 13, he writes, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. In this admonition, he emphasized the importance of doctrine, 
along with exhortation. It does very little good to exhort if there isn't some sound doctrine to back it up. Then in the 16th verse, he further instructs Timothy, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Doctrine does little good unless one takes heed to it. But in the hearing and heeding the word of the Lord, there is a great benefit. It will save the person who heeds it from falling. It is the strength or the spiritual strength and life of a person. One must constantly check himself with doctrine in order to keep his relationship right with God. Sound doctrine is the basis for spiritual strength and fellowship with God. It, and not the endeavor of man, is the answer to the spiritual problems of the times that we're living in today. The more it is preached and lived, the more the world will see that there is in reality a personal experience with God. The devil can't do much with those who embrace it and live by it. We don't hear as much good sound doctrinal preaching from the pulpits across this country as we should, but the value of it would make it worthwhile. The Apostle Paul again wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, and whereunto thou hast attained. That has been my purpose in bringing this message to you today. This is the purpose, that I want your soul to be nourished with good sound doctrine. If we fail, in this, we fail to accomplish the purpose of our calling. And what is the purpose of our calling? That we continue in the virtue of sound doctrine. God bless you.